Hi everybody, this is Kate Haley with Glazer's Camera. Thanks so much for joining us for PhotoFest, the virtual edition. Today's our last session for the day, but we have more coming up the rest of the week, so be sure to visit us each day for more awesome courses and content. Uh, for today's session, we have Sabrina Dang, who's a Sony artisan of imagery, and we're gonna talk about tips for fashion photography. If you have questions during this session, please feel free to post those either on the YouTube or Facebook comments and chat room, and we'll ask as many of those as we are able. Um, we do have just an hour with Sabrina today, and she has a ton to talk about, so we'll ask as many as we are able, but don't be shy. Please feel free to share those questions with us. Um, so, Sabrina, can you tell us a little bit about you, and um, then we'll just go right into your presentation. Hi, Kate. Hi. Thanks for having me. My name is Sabrina Deng. I'm a Sony artisan. I am based in San Francisco Bay Area, been in with the wedding industry for the last 10, 11 years. And I'm so excited uh, to be here to share my knowledge with you today. And I have over 300 slides and I hope I can get them through. <laughs> so many slides, so many slides. We're gonna do what we can. Yes. <laughs> so go ahead and kick into that presentation. And okay, so I will share my screen and you will see my desktop and then boom. Okay, welcome everybody to my session, 10 tips for better fashion portraits with uh, myself, Sabrina Deng. And uh, thanks for tuning in for an hour. And if you need to go to a bathroom, this is the perfect timing because the, my first 10 to 15 slides is just my own introduction. The rest is just, you guys gonna get like swarm of information um, over um, just a lot of pictures I want to share with you for my last 10 years of shooting experience um, from shoots around the world. And um, this is my social media connection. If you like to uh, follow my journey where before the COVID-19 where I was going and then after COVID-19 is over where I will be heading. And you can feel free to email me questions if I'm not able to answer them today due to time constraint. And I was born and raised in China, just a quick introduce um, where I came from. Uh, I came to the States when I was 14 years old and I went to UC Davis, uh, a school in California uh, for college. And in college, uh, I love taking pictures of my friends, especially pictures that during our parties and um, all the social gathering, it was the highlight of my college life. And being in San Francisco Bay Area after I graduated in college, um, I uh, studied managerial economics because that was um, one of the most staple profession um, as an analyst in the Bay Area. So I can, um, I, so then I don't have to become a burden to my parents uh, as an immigrant. And, uh, but working as a nine to five in, in an office that wasn't really fulfilling. And then I uh, discovered Scott Robert Lim uh, block on Zanga back in the days, um, more than 12 years ago. Yeah, so in 2008, I discovered Scott Robert Lim's blog on Zanga, and then he was asking for a translator to help him to organize this um, China workshop, China photography workshop, uh, that he has a group of students flying over from all around the world, from uh, Canada, from Japan, from Hong Kong, from Europe to join him in China for a one week workshop. And he needed a translator and uh, someone who can help him to connect with models. So I signed up and I asked him if I can be his translator and go to his workshop for free. So that was my very taste of photography and what it felt like to do nothing but photography, uh, spe especially in the genre of portrait photography for a week in China, while um, I was living in the Bay Area, traveling over there to meet up with Scott. Yeah, so ever since then I was hooked. And then um, he is my mentor, he, he was my mentor and he still is my mentor. And then, um, and. I think I was reading on one of his blog posts that Scott um, uh, uh, wrote about his joy of uh, his joy of competing. Um, I think the blog post title is "The Joy of Competition," and then that really, really inspired me to um, to compete in the photography uh, industry to get my name out as a um, as a newbie, as a beginning photographer, um, because I live in the 
San Francisco Bay Area, uh, every while well, we're in the tech hood, like every single engineer, they happen to be a weekend war warrior, sort of a shooter. So they have like massive amount of money to buy like super cool equipment, like like 5D Mark II or whatnot, but I was only shooting like a Canon Rebel or like a Nikon D40, like a level of uh, DSLR. Um, so I felt like in order for me to compete with these uh, engineers to make my name stand out, to get more clients is to uh, perhaps to follow the, the footstep of Scott, how he become an international award-winning photographer by competing at WPPI. So in the span of three years in 2010 and 2013, I uh, entered in every single round of competitions and uh, got my accolades and uh, have enough points to uh, become a master photographer with WPPI. Um, and uh, ever since then, I was, um, uh, get, I, I was able to get hired to do shoots uh, for wedding clients or sometimes editorial clients in uh, in Paris, in uh, Morocco, in uh, Venice. So um, because I do a lot of um, pre-wedding shoots, which is a combination of, um, so a pre-wedding shoot is something that uh, I, it's for a wedding client, but it's a shoot happened before the wedding day. So the couple will go like anywhere in the world that they wish, but they will bring their wedding attire with them. They will bring their wedding dress and then the tuxedo with them to travel to this destination to do the shoot. So it's like a very elaborate, uh, glamorous fashion shoot, but in wedding attire, uh, because this is such a unique uh, genre. It's very unique sort of a photo shoot. And I was able to uh, get some of my work published in various magazines. Um, so these are just a few of them. And so, and, uh, but I'm a wedding photographer by training uh, and that is what it pays the bill. But my passion really is doing fashion photography and fashion portraits. And I was having a blast while I was shooting a New York Fashion Week in 2013. And, um, and because the fashion, in the fashion photography genre, I feel like I can exercise a lot of creative ideas other than in the wedding photography genre. So in fashion, I can convey concepts like, um, like sadness, uh, anger, weird, um, which these kind of like concepts cannot be translated or cannot be uh, conveyed usually in like a wedding day photography. So that's why my heart, even though I'm a wedding photographer by profession, but my heart is, um, that I consider myself as a fashion shooter and fashion photographer. Um, so, and I also love uh, to travel. I blame Anthony Bourdain because I like the travel channel is my default channel on my TV. And I watch it over and over for all Anthony's, Anthony Bourdain's show, like no reservation, um, uh, uh, a cook's tour, whatnot. So, because I love to travel, and I think uh, being um, a photographer while traveling, all these being in a new place, all these things really, really excites me. And um, and doing this kind of destination pre-wedding shoot, it allows me to be the fashion photographer that I'm passionate about, and allows me to travel, and which is something that I I love to do um, in a heartbeat. So. Um, yeah, so that's kind of like my intro. And um, I love to, I, I wanna bring this up. Uh, if you can look at this documentary on, uh, I think it's on Prime, sorry, either on Netflix or on Prime, one of them, uh, it's on Prime. Uh, it's called, uh, The Ice Has to Travel by the Diana Veland. It's a really, really great documentary. And she's a former editor for Habas Bazaar and Vogue and um, for many, many years. And uh, she, um, it was a long documentary, but just to give you the key points from the show, uh, she said something about use fashion to transform people into fantasy. And don't be boring and don't, don't give them want the, what they want, but give them what they don't know uh, what they want yet. So I think it's very, very interesting because 
oftentimes in the wedding genre, especially, and we want to capture something like more of a very journalistic kind of style, and we want it to, to be very real. But on the contrary, fashion photography, fashion is not about that. It's about a fantasy. It's about a dream. It's about um, helping the client to be some something that they're not normally are. So I think that's very exciting. And and these are, I guess, the 10 points that I'm going to share with you how um, I, I do it, how I create these kind of fashion portraits for my client. Uh, a lot of these are my everyday client, and I just uh, use kind of a, a set of tools that I transform them from an everyday look into their kind of fantasy self. Yeah. Yeah. So these are the 10 points. So first point, it's like, uh, be your own fashion editor and know what to feature and how to create a world. How I create a world and how I become my own fashion, fa fashion editor while I'm shooting it, is that like I have to understand what I'm trying to feature what, during the shoot. Um, when I'm shooting these fashion portraits, it's about shooting uh, and featuring the clothes and it's about featuring their beauty and create this ultimate dream lifestyle that they live in it like yeah so and um i learned it from a fashion photography fashion photographer matthew jordan smith that um to create a call sheets to um to put all the timing of the shoot um to plan out all, all the time uh sorry to plan out the time of the shoot and location wardrobe hair and makeup, lighting, posing, and mood. Plan out all these elements that you wanna do throughout the shoot and, and write out the uh, items that, uh, how you want to execute the shoot to stay um, organized. Uh, so I'll, I'll go back to this later, but I wanna show you this shoot that I've done in Shanghai for, for Alicia and Nico. And these are uh, my client that they are residing in China. And they were looking for an engagement photographer that can do very high fashion editorial style shoots for them instead of a, just a normal lovey-dovey romantic kind of shoot and create uh, something unique for them. So uh, to show you their shoot, what it was like. And I think before um, I shot for them, I think three months before, three months before, and I start concepting the shoot and um, because they were living in Shanghai at the time. Uh, and Shanghai in China is a very metropolitan city and it's got a lot of Western influence and, and, um, and it has like a lot of a colonial past history as well. So because of that, and I uh, took inspiration from the Great Gatsby era and then also uh, took inspiration from uh, a very like uh, Great Gatsby kind of fashion shoot lighting to apply for this shoot. Um, yeah, and, and I went on Pinterest and find these old calendar of Chinese women who, who, who are very, very heavily makeup, but they're wearing like a very Oriental style kind of clothes too. And th these kind of Oriental style clothes, it was very avant-garde back then because it's not too revealing, but it also shows the shape of the body. And it's concealing and, sh and like in a very sexy way too. And then my hands, gloves and cape were very part of the, that Gatsby inspiration. So before I, um, before I went to China to shoot their, uh, their session, I went on eBay and bought a lot of uh, clothes, vintage clothes, I bought a lot of like hats and then gloves and, and um, jackets. That's why you see throughout uh, the presentation, some of the clothes will show up again uh, because I, after the I kept the clothes. I'm not giving to them because I like. Um, but anyway, so because clothes for I feel like the clothes for people nowadays is not about just covering. It's part of expression who they are and who they want to be. And I feel as a photographer, we need to be highly involved and participate in the clothing selection process. That's why I nominate myself to can I help you guys to find the, some of these wardrobe items on eBay. And anyway, so like this is the um the the place of the shoot because they um uh they wanted to they live in shanghai and then they're surrounded by a lot of these small town 
it's surrounded by water. So it's kind of like a little Venice, um, mini, mini version of Venice and surrounded by their city. And uh, because I was there with uh, my mentor, Scott Robert, two years before the shoot. So I kind of had an idea what it looks like. And this was a travel photo, but I want, I included the travel photo as part of the final output of the session. So here it is, that's the final output of the shoot from the Shanghai session. So yeah, and then, um, so the story is about this girl living in Shanghai and expect living there and waiting for her love to arrive. And she's kind of shy and, and then boom, he arrives, you know, Nico arrives from, um, from Europe to the Orient, just, you know, encountering her and then they and then he got lost and she's showing him like how to find his way back to maybe the hotel or something just made it up okay um but and then he present her a gift a gift of a omega watch omega i'll tell you the story later omega watch and then give it to her and then that represent the token of his love and then like, you know, norm, like in the dating time, you know, they will have tea and so forth. Yeah. And then they will go, go on the gondola, you know, look at the places and spend their time. And, you know, do their dating, the course of their dating, not everything is, small, is smooth sailing and they will fight on things and have disagreement and distrust happen. And wow, she got so upset and, or I don't know, something happened and then she went away, went away with the gondola too, bye-bye. And she never came back. Uh, sorry, I said it too fast. And the pond become like, you know, deserted and the flower doesn't grow anymore. And he's so sad, oh, please come back. And he will pray in the temple every day for her to come back. Um, yeah. and wow, maybe she's coming back. <laughs> Sorry, I said it a very cheesy way. But yeah, you get the idea. And then, and then, okay, boom, she came back and then they got married. Um, in this special night, she wears this Chinese wedding dress um, because it, their place is in China. That's where they call home now. And they got together. So that's why I call it the in, this session, Immortal Love. And I think you as a photographer uh, need to work very closely with your client, hair and makeup artists and the lighting people and the assistant post-production team to make sure everybody knows what your storyline is about. And uh, that's why before the session, um, I uh, share mood board with, with them. And so I wanna show you. So like that, those, um, uh, pictures of inspiration that was shared amongst everybody in the entire team. And uh, yeah, so that was point number one, to create a world for, you know, everybody in your team, including your client and live in it. So, okay, point two. Uh, actually, Kate, is there any questions for me before I move on to point two? No, not yet. So keep great. Proceed on. It's great. The, that great. was a really be so, beautiful photo essay. So yeah, keep going. Thank you. <laughs> so point two uh, is during to do these sort of shoot, uh, you must have a master shoot plan to have a plan because um, it all, well as you can see from the Shanghai shoot, in, it involves a lot of changing uh, wardrobe, changing hair, changing location as well. Even though it's in the same town, everything is done with uh, walking distance, but it's still, you know, if, and it still involves a lot of like changing. So how do I keep track of that? Is that, um, uh, sorry. So it's to um, like come use, uh, I use this call sheets from fashion shoot I learned this from fashion photography um, that to uh, write everything down from the call sheets. Like, what do you want to do at 10 a.m. While, while she's already like, you know, to, to be ready to shoot by the stairs. Um, and she'll be wearing this, this purple wardrobe with the green cape and the hair needs to be up. Um, uh, lighting, it's like a soft box and then uh, pretend to be very natural light looking. And the posing is she is looking down and like 
appearing to be shy and the mood you want to convey for th the first session of the shoot is to um, like a fresh, innocent sort of look. So you get the idea of uh, what uh, these kind of uh, master call sheets that um, that I do, and you should come up with your own. Uh, what I, I actually what I'm gonna do in the future is to include another column for uh, gears uh, because I'm shooting with like more than one camera nowadays. It's like um, it's sometimes I just want to like keep track of like what the gears that I use for this session and how many light stands, and then what's if I use you know. Uh, what's the output like all, all this uh, technical spec I want to include that as a call in the call sheet too so uh, that's for myself in the future what I'm gonna do um, yeah so point three gears are really important um, so in that Shanghai shoot uh, that was before mirrorless in the days of uh, in, in the days of dominance by DSL cameras and then I felt like I got hit by a train at the end of the day um, carrying uh, huge DSLR cameras and the lens are like e enormous. And uh, because I get high, I got higher from uh, uh, to shoot around the world more than a lot more ever since I've published those series of pictures. So packing, packing the right gears and having the right gears for my shoot is more, it's a lot more important than before. And um, so switching, that's why I switched to Nikon to Sony uh, in, I think in 2012, 2012, yeah, 2012. And uh, because uh, it was a natural me natural fit for me to shoot everything in mirrorless because I can pack everything in my backpack um, and I can fit everything in the overhead compartment. Uh, so this is me before mirrorless and it, um, it's like huge DSLR, huge lens and it, like great, image quality with Sony A99, but hey, the mirrorless is a lot smaller and it's, it allows me to be a lot more fluid and mobile. So, and I can easily travel by myself and by carrying all the gears on my backpack too. And here's how the gears that I use. Um, and I have a Sony A9, A7 III, the A7R4, that which I got like just two months ago and the Sony RX1R Mark II. And I used to shoot a lot with the Sony's, uh, the RX1 before, uh, but now there's a new, uh, well, newer version and then I kept the newer version. Yeah, so for myself, the smaller is definitely the better because uh, I'm a small petite person. It just allows me to be more mobile. And, and whatever, everything fits in my backpack is very, very important because uh, I, I get so scared when I hear all these stories about photographers getting their gear stolen in Greece or in San Francisco. And I just, you know, when I'm not shooting with an assistant, I need to make sure everything I can carry. And if say like, you know, someone comes to steal, it's gonna be harder time for them to snatch it off from, from my back rather than just laying the gears around on the ground. Uh, so what it fits in my backpack is very important. And um, basically this is all the gears that I carry, uh, except for actually the light stands and the umbrella and the flash and the, so the little softbox, those goes into my suitcase and all the rest goes into my backpack. And I carry a little uh, veil with me too during my shoot. So then like it adds interest. I'm gonna talk about veil, how veil that adds into uh, my pictures that creates uh, visual impact in the later, uh, uh, later on in a couple of the slides. So um, here's how the gears that I shoot and my uh, favorite combination for wedding day is the A7 III and the A9 because um, as I told you, I, I'm a wedding by training uh, and it's my full-time uh, sort of photographer being a wedding photographer. So I shoot a lot of A9 and A7 III. The 24 megapixel, it's more than enough um, to for uh, someone to make a huge album. And, um, and I shoot a lot uh, with the 2470 and this and if I have to shoot in a larger space, a large church or a huge grass area, enormous size clubhouse, I'll use the 70 to 200. And then um, uh, 55, 18, uh, it's uh, mount on my camera all the time. So the 2470 and the 55 is what I have on my camera uh, all the time uh, when I'm shooting a wedding. 
um, yeah, so, and then I just recently got the 2414 and, um, and when I need to shoot low lights, then I swap the 2414 uh, instead of the 2470, especially at nighttime during reception. And I'll just zoom with my feet because in, in reception, um, dance floor and whatnot, I can walk closer to the subject, walk closer to the bride and groom versus uh, during um, ceremony. Uh, I, I'm kind of have to stay like not very close to them because you know ceremony is just very intrusive to be very close to the bride and groom. Yeah. Anyway, so the, I would rent the eighty-five one four for for wedding day too. Just you know, have a different look. And uh, for my uh, pre-wedding shoot and engagement shoot, also um, fashion shoot, I would use um, the A seven R four, which I just got not too long ago, and the A nine. Uh, I shoot with two body, and then uh, mount with the A seven R four with the fifty five, one uh, A, and then the twenty four seventy on the A nine. And uh, maybe if I have to shoot like uh, in a very low light situation at nighttime, the 2414, uh, the 20, the 24.14 uh, uh, for like kind of like nighttime landscape, uh, low light situation. And yeah, so this was shot in Shanghai for a different couple. Um, that was with the A7R2 and uh, with the 2470. And 2470, it's my, um, I think for shooting pre pre wedding and engagement and also like uh, fashion photo, uh, I can do seventy percent to eighty percent of the shots uh, with the twenty four seventy, and the twenty four seventy it's like really really sharp for me. And for this uh, picture, I shot with the F ten because I want to see uh, the detail from his shirts all the way to the back. Um, of the back of the building, these building signs, and then her veil, everything is in focus. So then the retoucher has more room uh, to uh, work when he's retouching um, these photographs. And the 2470, uh, when zoom at the 45 millimeter, and it's got still got very great bokeh. It's very natural looking, and um, it gives uh, the subject, for this case, he's the groom um, of my uh, Shanghai shoot, it gives him very good, like natural, uh, smooth skin tone as well. And this is like a shot, no retouch, a shot at uh, f7.1. So yeah, th so that was 24 uh, to 70, f2.8. And um, I also love the 5518 as a very fashion editorial look. So for a fashion editorial shoot, uh, I shoot with the a7R4 and then my 35, from the RX1, R2, because it's very, very superior sort of image quality. And I use the A9 for backup too. Um, yeah, and I mount the um, A7R4 with the 55 and then um, the A9 with the 2470. And these two pictures were shot in Macau, in Macau, China. Macau is, uh, it was a, a Portuguese uh, colony. And uh, it's got a lot of like really interesting Portuguese influence to the city, but it also maintained a very, uh, the ch ch Chinese traditions. So that's why uh, when I photographed this couple and I want to like, you know, that's why he, he's wearing a sunglasses and then she's wearing a very Western style dress. But with this, against this very Oriental um, uh, uh, architecture, a Asian style architecture and shot with the 5518. And uh, I like um, uh, shooting 5518. I know it's not a zoom, but I'll just zoom with my feet. It's okay because it's a client. It's not a wedding where I have to be one place all the time because when I'm shooting these kind of uh, pre-wedding editorial style shoot, I can zoom with my feet and get closer to the subject. And um, yeah, so the 5518 uh, just, you know, stay back and, and when you need to, shoot more of an architecture space and just get walk closer to the subject when you need to uh, see uh, her expression and the detail of the clothes. And these, the 50, actually, I have a lot of photographers ask me, what about the 50? Actually, 50 is very good too. Uh, the 50, uh, uh, one four panel, um, size, it's size lens and I, I love the image quality of it too. So um, if I need to uh, shoot in a lower light situation and I would uh, borrow the 50, one four and yeah, and shoot with that. 
Um, so uh, the A9, uh, which I really like, it's five stop dynamic range um, and I can shoot 20 frames per second and it's got dual card slots and it's silent shooting, um, especially for wedding photography and silent shooting is very useful. And just to quickly show you like, this is plus three stop of exposure. Um, so it's like pitch dark shooting this couple and but they still want a picture at this highway. I don't know why, but for some reason they really, really want to, I'll just take it. I will see what happens. But in Lightroom, you know, I just push the exposure slide three stop and boom, this is like what it comes out and plus four stops of exposure um, for for my friend uh, Christine during this portrait shoot and you can see the difference with the A9 and plus five stop of exposure um, shooting I was shooting this couple in the Sahara Desert in Morocco and it was already like the end um, the very very because by the time we came out to shoot it was like very close to sunset and then we only got a little little time to shoot during sunset and then they still want to keep going I'm like okay I'll just keep shooting and so and then, uh, but I was still able to, glad that I was still able to use this picture after like five stop of uh, exposure push on the slider on Lightroom. So props for A9. Um, yeah, and I just got the A7R4 and which I haven't used much, but I only use it for one shoot because of uh, COVID-19 social, uh, social distancing. It's very hard for us to be out and not get caught to shoot. But um, uh, with the 15, stop dynamic range is like crazy. Um, and it's got very powerful uh, AF tracking system and the real time IAF for uh, mo the movie shooters and it's 61 megapixel. So if you own the A7R4, be sure to, one is to update your Lightroom to be the latest Lightroom version because otherwise it cannot read the raw file uh, because it's such a new camera. I just update my Lightroom today in order to show you the next couple pictures and um, uh, and buy a ton of memory cards because the 61 megapixel is sucks up your memory card space a lot faster. But that's great for an editorial shoot. It's really good, good for um, shooting in a low light places and you know that uh, you can bring the detail out later. Yeah, so, uh, so, <laughs> shooting in San Francisco that was like uh, two a week ago yeah a week ago in San Francisco and uh, it was like already so dark but I still want to get the landscape um, so this is like you know only three stop that I push on the slider but you know I I can't imagine what it would be look like if you shoot like pitch dark and then do the 15 stop uh, dynamic range exposure change and um, and like yeah so these sort of detail you can see it's very wonderful with the a7r4 and all the shadow area i can you know just rescue in lightroom and it's got like it's very sharp too uh if you use a 70 to 200 it's like corner to corner sharpness even um uh so this was shot in f2.8 and then I, you see like the no well nobody's gonna tell me to crop to crop just the window out but um, like no editor is ever going to ask me to do that. But if someone is going to ask me to something like crop the airing out uh, from a shoot, so the A7R4 will come very, very handy because as you can see, even the detail of the windows are super like, you know, sharp and it's just amazing camera. Yeah, so that was A7R4, which I'm going to use from now on for all my fashion editorial and client uh, pre-wedding shoot. Um, for actually, before I go on, uh, Kate, is there any questions? We good? Did you? Okay, sorry. Yeah, we're good right now. Thanks, Sabrina. Okay. Uh, everybody's just listening and watching. So <laughs> sorry, it's just a lot we, of we have about yeah, twenty five so minutes left. I know. Um, I get a lot of people asking me, um, like how much time you spend on location scouting and then what do you do on location scouting right so before i shoot um if i'm shooting in a destination where it requires me to fly say like in a different country uh say i'm shooting on friday i'll try to get myself there on monday just to get myself to accommodate with the environment with the weather 
and spend the rest of the next couple of days to scout. And I like to scout the location, like mark down the, so location A, this part has the best light at 4 p.m. This bench is got like a great reflection from the building, uh, which is good for hair light, so forth at 2 p.m. So I will mark those items down during location scouting. And um, during location scouting, uh, I take my uh, pocket camera, the RX100 Mark IV. Now, it, uh, maybe Sarah and Hector can chime in later. Uh, I think it's a, the newest version is Mark 7 now, the RX100 Mark 7, um, but I'm still using the, the Mark 4, but it's still got amazing image quality for location scouting. And, and because I love to travel and I use those times for location scouting before the shoot and also immerse myself with the local culture and um, eat their food and read some books and hang out in the bookstore and talk to the local people, what will be a very maybe cool spot that from the locals perspective, I can go check out if th those are good location to shoot my clients as well. And, and uh, the RX100 Mark IV, because it's got 20 megapixel, it's got a built-in ND filter, and it's a, you can shoot 16, uh, 14 to 16 frames per second, and it shoots RAW and JPEG. And you can capture a still uh, while shooting a 4K video. Um, yeah, so I love the built-in uh, ND filter from the RX100 Mark IV, the pocket camera, because it's like a putting a sunglasses in front of your camera, but uh, in this case, it's all built in. Um, and, and the RX100 Mark IV, uh, you can shoot like, because when I was in Venice, I, I have to shoot video because it's so cool seeing the boats come, come by. And while I'm shooting video, it's 4K and I just have to press the shutter to capture um, a still image from exactly the same frame, the same place of where I was looking at. So it's a really good feature. And I hate asking other tourists to take pictures for me while I'm traveling because they always take either out of focus picture or like crooked, it's like, you know, composed poorly. Even I tell them to put me there and they still shoot it like, crook like crooked. So I rather shoot my, my own picture, my own travel picture by myself using um, uh, the remote, uh, uh, connect with the RX100 Mark IV and, and publish my own selfie in that way, my own travel picture. Um, so. Uh, so this is one of them and I shot this in Venice and I just set my RX100 Mark IV on the table behind me and just um, connect uh, the remote with my left hand. My right hand is visible holding the water, but my left hand was holding the, my, um, my phone uh, while it's triggering um, uh, my uh, camera via boot, uh, Bluetooth, yeah, uh, with the RX100 Mark IV. So while I'm doing location scouting for the client, and I will use the same place to out, uh, to shoot to take pictures for myself. And uh, I was in when I was in Spain two years ago. I was really inspired by these tiles in the stair in the stairway. In this place is called uh, Span, uh, Plaza de España in in Sevilla in Spain. This is one of the most famous monument in Sevilla. And I was really I love the way how. The, these tiles were reflecting light and 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 I know I have to take a picture uh, for the client but uh, I was only uh, location location scouting and I put myself there as a testing subject first and I set the camera on the ground and then uh, set um, and then shoot it with the Wemo and then uh, when I go back and shoot with the client next day this is the result with the me holding the camera so, but this picture I shot myself, it was like, you know, via remote, but this picture is me holding the camera. It's the same place, but I use myself as a practice. So I highly recommend you doing that while you're, uh, you know, during location scouting to put yourself in this as a subject to photograph first. Yeah, so right just around the corner of the same location. And I really like this light you know, by the doorway. And then also like you see like really interesting architecture 
through the two arches. So I shot a picture for myself during location scouting next day when I shoot the client, uh, just from a little bit different, uh, uh, a little bit different perspective because of the light hits the client better. Um, so yeah, so same spot, but picture for myself as a souvenir, as a traveler the day before, and the next day shooting professionally for the client using RX 100 Mark IV. And I know there's a lot of people asking, so like, you know, what will be the timeline timeline for from your concept of the shoot to image delivery? I'm not gonna go through everything, but you can take a picture and screen grab uh, if this is useful for you. Uh, but basically, um, uh, like, yeah, so this is like the process uh, from like in, uh, the client sending inquiry uh, a couple months before, and then one month before we, storyboards and share Pinterest uh, as a storyboard. And then uh, one, one week uh, before to have a logistic plan, equipment plan, location scouted out. And then, yeah, and then the shoot happened, during the shoot happened. Um, I mean, after the shoot happened, uh, within a week, I sent all the JPEG to the client as uh, so then they can use it as a way of uh, to narrow down to the retouch photograph that they want. Um, I recommend them to choose 10, uh, top 10 of their favorite picture if I can fill in the rest. Uh, say the, the package comes with 20 and then they choose uh, 10 and then I choose 10. That will be much better. But um, I try to if, if I can try to convince them, if I can choose them all, then it, it, it eliminate some of the time in between. Um, but so a lot of back and forth uh, during we re retouch process and I send it off to a retoucher. Um, and uh, and then after the final image is done, I, I upload them into SmartMug and then um, send the image download link to the client. Yep, and uh, send them prints too to the client. And that whole process takes about three months from start to finish. Um, but yeah, you can adjust your own. So point four, um, to have a good understanding of color, why color matters for these kind of uh, fashion portraits. Um, I, um, well, I'm Chinese and uh, I have been living in the States for 26 years. I came here when I was 14 years old. And um, so I've become like a half and half. I'm like half American, half Chinese. I'm a really odd breed. Um, but uh, living here as a teenager forwards, I become very, very Americanized. And I kind of start lo lost my touch with my roots, uh, where I came from. Uh, because growing up um, in the Bay Area, even though there's a lot of Asian uh, but I still, you know, want to blend in. I don't want to stand out because I'm obviously very, very stand out, um, you know, speak English with an accent. So um, just, I guess in, in my college life and I, there's a lot of me trying to deny my Chinese-ness, my, my Asian skin, um, my, uh, my culture. But after becoming older, you know, starting to become a photographer, I understand actually, you know, chi being Chinese is actually my advantage of, you know, bridging the world of East and West. And that's why a lot of clients from China or from Hong Kong, um, they want to hire someone like me being a uh, Chinese American that can bring uh, East cross West sort of point of view. Um, uh, into the photograph to create a picture story for them. And uh, I really like uh, this cinematographer. His name is Christopher Doyle. He shot uh, In the Mood of Love. He shot Chunking Express, Days of Being Wild, and um, uh, uh, 2046. Yeah, so which is 2046, you can uh, look it up on Amazon Prime right now, it's free. And he's one of the best direct uh, of cinematographer in the entire Asia. I think even one of the best in the world. And and he said, um, cause he's, he's Caucasian and but living in China and Hong Kong, living in Hong Kong for the past, I don't know, like 50 years or something. So he speak Cantonese fluently.
mentioned something about the Chinese red. The, I mean, they, he mentioned something about red, the red color, um, and which really, really like, you know, touched me. And he said red because it's such an evocative color in Chinese culture. To put red anywhere, it really says something. It smacks you in the face and has a certain uh, re reances. And all color have a culture baggage. And that's why for me, when I got contact from uh, Joao and Batata, a couple from Macau, they were living in, in Macau. Um, Joao was born and raised in Macau. So he's half Portuguese and half Chinese. And Batata, she is full Chinese and born and raised in China, but they met in uh, some sort of a, a fashion shoot. And Macau, uh, actually Joao, he's a photographer too. And uh, 